Chapter 31 The temple run by Giorgio the Exorcist was recently built in a spacious compound within Giorgio Temple District. Sano, Morume, and Fukida walked through a gate whose red columns gleamed with fresh lacquer. Inside the compound, the lavishly carved and painted pagoda rose above the grounds, lost with flowering shrubs. Crowds of people from all classes streamed in and out of the huge main worship hall. A servant directed Sano and the detective to a minor worship hall secluded by a grove of pine trees. Two men, who looked like wrestlers disguised as monks, guarded the door. They bowed courtly to Sano and his men. We want to see Juju, said Fukita. His honorable holiness can't be disturbed at the moment he's conducting an exorcism. This is honorable Chamberlain Sano, and he disturbs whomever he wants, when he wants, Marume said. The monk stood aside. No and his men removed their shoes and entered the hall, a large, cool chamber that smelled powerfully of sweet incense. It was dark, except for a single lamp burning at the far end, illuminating a tall man. His saffron robe, his brocade stole, his naked arms, and his shaved head gleam as if he made of gold. He seemed to float rather than stand. His face was obscured by the shadows that filled the chamber, whose walls and ceiling were draped in black cloth. But Sano figured he must be Jojo. Hands pressed together under his chin, fingers pointing upwards. Jojo gazed silently at the floor. As Sano's eyes grew accustomed to the darkness, he saw other persons present. One lay at Jojo's feet, a second knelt nearby. They and the priest occupied a die, elevated above the floor, on which Sano and his men stood. Below the die, huddled figures sat. Want me to stop the ritual? Maruma said quietly to Sano. No. Sano knelt behind the audience. His men followed suit. He was interested in what the ritual could tell him about the exorcist. Jojo addressed the figure that knelt by him. What is your name? His voice was hushed, but so deep and so resonant that it filled the chamber. Mankichi, the figure said in a voice that belonged to a man in his forties or fifties. I am a moneylender, Fukita whispered. <laughs> that figures. You have to be rich to afford an exorcism performed by Jojo. Spirit possession was rampant all over Japan. People often attributed illnesses, mental problems, or bizarre behavior to evil spirits that had taken over their bodies. Exorcists enjoyed a flourishing trade, and Jojo was in such demand that he could charge exorbitant prices for his rituals. Who is this you've brought me? Jojo asked. My wife, said the moneylender. Her name is Onaru. The prone figure was a woman swaddled in a blanket. Her body squirmed like a caterpillar trying to break out of its cocoon. She whimpered and grunted. She won't eat or sleep. She won't talk. Just make those noises. Onado's head tossed from side to side. When it turned towards the lamp, Sano glimpsed her face. Her eyes were closed, her features sunken. From the audience came the muffled sound of a woman weeping, other people shushing her. They must be relatives of the couple. Do you think she's possessed? The moneylender asked fearfully. Do you? Fukida whispered to Marume. I guess we're going to find out, Marume whispered. There had been a time when Sano had thought that most, if not all, people were taken over by spirits were either faking or deluded. But then he had gone to Isokashima and witnessed an actual horrific case of possession that had changed his mind. We shall see, Jojo said. He knelt beside Onado. His face came within the halo of brightness around the lamp's flame. He had features so perfect, so handsome, and so strongly masculine that he looked like an ideal version of a man. Sano knew that Jojo was well over forty, but in the dim light he seemed ageless. His large, deep-set eyes glowed with wisdom and compassion. Jojo held his hands over the woman, palms down, just above her body. He moved them slowly up and down her length, not touching her. The air between his hands and the woman shimmered. The smell of incense grew stronger, the air thick with smoke. An eerie feeling rippled through Sano. His eyes, throat and head began to ache. The detective stirred uneasily. Onado moaned as if in pain. I feel the presence of not one, not two, but three spirits inside her, Jojo said. The audience murmured in consternation. The moneylender said, Please, can you make them go away? I will try, Jojo said. This should be good, Morume whispered to Fukita. Closing his eyes, reaching towards the woman, Jojo intoned, O spirits within Onaro, speak to me. 
An orange light flashed to the right of the die. The audience murmured. The light went out. Its after image burned into Sandro's vision, trailing streams of smoke. A blue light, then a red, fled in different parts of the room, then disappeared. A primitive fear crept into Sano. The audience sat in frozen silence. I hear them, Dodo said. Honorable spirits, tell me who you are. He listened. They say they have no names. They are children who died before they were born. Amazement stirred the audience. Even though everyone knew Jojo was famous for communicating with the spirits of dead fetuses. Children, how did you die? There's a pause. Jojo frowned as if much disturbed. They were murdered. Horrified exclamations arose. Children, who was your mother? Jojo said. Onaru gasped and groaned. She sounded as if his outstretched hands were extracting some physical substance from her body. A weird, tuneless music began. Hairs rose on Sano's snape. Fukita nudged Marume, who muttered under his breath. I, c I can't hear you. Could you speak more clearly? As Jojo concentrated, the muscles on his face strained. I'm getting a name. It sounds like e e Imiko, the moneylender cried in a voice filled with horror. Jojo opened his eyes and asked, Do you know this woman? Sh she was a maid in my house. Sano supposed that Jojo could have made a lucky guess, and the moneylender had supplied the name. Furthermore, these exorcisms were booked months in advance, long enough for Jojo to investigate her cl his clients. But Sano had once communicated with the spirit himself. He knew the dead did speak. The children say you're their father, Jojo told the moneylender. They say that you... After you planted each of them inside Emiko, you sent her to an abortionist. He cut the children out of her womb. They suffered terribly. And during the third abortion, Emiko died. As the family members gasped, another orange light flared above the die, accompanied by a soft explosion. In its brightness appeared an image of fetuses. The eyes were covered by lotus leaves, the body severed at the waist and dripping blood. Women in the audience screamed. Fukita and Murume cursed out loud. Revulsion gripped Sano. The light went out. The gory image disappeared. Is it true? Jojo asked the moneylender. Did you impregnate Emiko, then have her and her children destroyed? Yes, the moneylender said, sobbing with terror and guilt. I confess, I didn't want a pregnant maid around. My wife would be jealous. I didn't want the children. I didn't know what else to do. His story was a variation on a common tale. People succumbed to lust, begetting unwanted babies. Married couples had children they couldn't support. Prostitutes were impregnated by the customers. As a result, many infants were killed before or soon after birth. And abortionists had proliferated in Edo. The government forbade abortionists to advertise their services on signs outside their shops, but didn't outlaw them. The number of abandoned homeless orphans was a big problem. And although Sano deplored this widespread practice of killing children, he considered that sometimes abortion was the best solution. Some women were raped. Would Chiyo and Fumiko be among those to discover themselves pregnant afterwards? Sano hoped they wouldn't have to hear their rapist children and compound their suffering. The souls of your unborn children are caught between the realms of the living and the dead, Jojo said. They have entered your wife's body. She is so weakened by their sorrow and loneliness that she might die. No, the moneylender cried. I beg you to save her. Jojo raised his hands and moved as it palpating an invisible object in the air. Concern darkened his handsome features. I feel the presence of another spirit. A rust like wings in flight whooshed over the assembly. Onaru let out a bone chilling wail. Her family screamed. Sano felt something soft graze his head. As everyone ducked and gazed fearfully around the room, only Jojo remained calm. It is Emiko, he said. She is here. Look, cried a woman in the audience. Her ghost. She pointed at the ceiling. There hovered a black, translucent shape that rippled like a whale in the wind. Merciful gods, Morume said. The moneylender threw himself face down on the die, his head shielded by his arms and moaned. Jojo lifted his palms to the ghost. Emiko-san, why have you come here? 
A low, thunderous sound quaked the room. Women in the audience shrieked. Men muttered. Ronaldo wailed and thrashed. She is angry with you, Toto explained to the moneylender. She wants revenge for her and her children's suffering and death. She has punished you by sending the children to haunt your wife. Weeping hysterically, the moneylender said, Make her stop them! Make her go away! The thunder sound rumbled louder. The ghost fluttered with a noise like a monsoon whistling. I cannot, Toto said regretfully. Only you can. But how? You must repent for your sins. She demands a sacrifice. Tell me what it is. I'll do anything she want. Thunder boomed. Jojo listened, then said, You must donate a hundred koban to this temple, in order that I may continue helping those in need. Sano knew that all exorcisms ended like this. The spirits all wanted money, and since they couldn't spend it, the money went to the priest. The moneylender grabbed a box that had been laying near him in the shadows, opened it and dumped shiny gold coins in front of Jojo. Here! Jojo ignored the coins, even as they cast glittering reflections onto his face. He addressed the ghost. You have your wish. Now call your children to come out of this innocent woman. He tells her to Onaro. You are free to depart to the spirit world where you belong. A burst of white light engulfed the ghost. Red, orange and blue lights flickered. Onaro howled and writhed like a woman giving birth. Scream from the audience drowned in thunder and explosions that rocked the temple. Jojo stood, hands spread and face lifted to the heavens, changing prayers. Acrid smokes billowed while the weird, dissonant music played, and Sano, Maruma, and Fukida watched in awe. Then the lights went out, the sound of music faded, the silence hushed the assembly. Jojo announced, Emiko and the children are gone. From behind the black curtain stopped monks carrying round white lanterns. Everyone blinked in the sudden brightness. Smoke tinged the air. The moneylender sat up and looked at his wife. Onaru? She lay still and peaceful in the litter on which she'd been brought. Husband, she murmured. Take her home and let her rest. She'll be fine. The moneylender and the family bowed to Jojo. All smiles, they carried the dazed Onaru out of the room. Was that real? Okita asked. I don't know. Maruma sounded shaken out of his usual cheer. But if they're happy, I guess I'm happy. Sano rose and walked towards Jojo, who stood on the die, hands clasped with his chest. He didn't seem surprised to see Sano. He must have been aware of Sano's presence all along. Perhaps those deep, glowing eyes could see in the dark. Welcome, honorable chamberlain, Jojo said. Although we've never been formally introduced, I know you by sight. He didn't look as ageless now. The shadow of black stubble on his head receded far back on his scalp. Lines in his golden skin bracketed his mouth and whipped the skin at the corner of his eyes. The muscles had begun to sag. He also seemed tired from his exertions. He bathed in sweat, but he descended from the dye with the agility of a young man, and he had an allure that transcended his physical being. He wore holiness, and he did glittering stole, which caused Sano to distrust him more than he would the usual suspect. That was quite a show you put on, Sano said. Fry humor upturned the corner of Jojo's mouth. I'll take that as a compliment. The salvation of souls can be quite dramatic, as you've seen. Especially with a little help from opium in the incest and a few theatrics, Sano said. No such theatrics had accompanied the phenomenon he'd witnessed in Ekoshima. Sano had more than a hunch that Jojo was a charlatan. Jojo laughed, the sound startling the boisterous. I see that you like rational explanations. Supposing I did employ the kind of trigger that you accused me of. Why not, if it dries out the spirits and restores people to sanity? Point taken, Sano said. But possession by spirit isn't the cause of every illness. It may be rarer than it seems. Indeed not, spirits are all around us. Always seeking innocent victims to hunt. Jojo opened his arms wide. We all have the power to communicate with the spirit world. But few of us know how to use it. I am one of the few. I have dedicated my life to freeing humanity from evil spirits and laying them to peaceful rest. He spoke as if he believed what he said. Perhaps he truly did. At a handsome profit, Sano commented. Irritation glinted in the black world of Jojo's eyes. Not for myself, for my temple, 
for the benefit of the faithful who come to worship. May I ask why you're here? Perhaps you're in need of my services? As a matter of fact, I am, Sano said. Oh, Toto said smug because he thought he had the advantage over Sano, who was in trouble. My cousin, Sano said, her name is Chio. Chio didn't react to the name, but he was clearly a man in control of how he appeared. What are her symptoms? She has nightmares, Sano said. Raigo told him that. Nightmares are often caused by spirit possession. Not in this case, Sano said. My cousin was recently kidnapped and raped, so was a 12-year-old girl named Fumiko. I need your help with finding the person who did it. I'm sorry, but I don't know what use I could be, Toto said. He hadn't reacted to the mention of the crimes or seemed to recognize Fumiko's name. I'm not a policeman. You speak to the spirits. Maybe they can give me some information. The spirits speak to me about themselves and their wishes. I can't interrogate them about matters that don't concern them. Toto remained cautious, but impatient tinged his voice. Never mind the spirits then, Thano said. You can help me in another way. How's that? You can tell me about your relations with two Okka drivers named Jinchishi and Gombei. Toto looked confused, perturbed. Thano thought he'd finally hit his target, but then Toto said, They transport suppliers for the temple. Are they responsible for the crimes you mentioned? They're suspects. Sano wondered whether Jojo's business with the drivers was as innocent as the priest claimed. If not, Jojo might have denied knowing them. We also might have realized that people had seen him with them and it was better not to lie. Can you tell me where they are? I'm afraid not. I haven't seen them in perhaps a month. If they turn up here, I'll be sure to let you know. He walked towards the door, drawing Sano and the detective with him, anxious for them to leave. Maybe Sano had hit him close to home after all. They are not really su the only suspects, Sano said. Your name also came up in my course of investigation. My name? Jonas' expression altered. Sano saw shock and an emotion harder to interpret. You can't believe that I kidnapped those two women. Three women, Sano said. There was another, a nun, from a convent near the very temple. Was that fear in Jojo's eyes? No, no, I don't believe you kidnapped them. I believe Jinchichi and Gumbai did. They procure women for clients with special tastes. Are you one of those clients? Of course not. Dota's expression shifted into outrage mingled with disdain. When I became a priest, I vowed never to harm anyone. I also took a vow of celibacy. Vows can be broken, not mine. Dota radiated sanctimoniousness. The work I do requires me to be pure in mind, body and soul. If I'd committed those crimes, the spirits wouldn't talk to me. Marume laughed. That was one of the more original proofs of innocence we'd been uh, ever offered. It's not good enough. Let's see if you can come up with something based in this world. Sano asked the priest where he'd been during the period when the women were missing. Can't recall exactly, Jojo said. But I was probably praying, conducting exorcisms and fulfilling my duties at the temple from sunrise to sundown. And after sundown? I sleep. Can anyone vouch for you? The monks, the servants, and the other priests here. The people whom I conduct exorcisms. I may have called on some government officials. I'll need a list of everyone, Sano said. I'll gladly provide it. I'll also provide you a list of good character references, Jojo said with a sly smile. The Shogun will be at the top of the list. Are you aware that His Excellency is my patron? I am. Sano knew that Shogun was enthusiastic about religion in general, and mysticism in particular, but now Sano realized that the Shogun's patronage of Jojo threatened to complicate his investigation. The Shogun was often more loyal to his favorite priests than to his top retainers. In a conflict between Sano and Jojo, whose side would he take? Jojo ordered his pastor's laugh. And then I don't need to warn you to think before you prosecute me. Chapter 32 Sano returned to Edo Castle after dark, when the night watch patrol guards roamed the passages with torches that smoldered and hissed in the moist evening air. Thunder murmured as Sano and his entourage dismounted at the gate. Hirata rode up. One look at his friend's face warned Sano that things hadn't gone well for Hirata either. In his office, Sano poured sake from himself and Hirata. Any news? My men and I spent the day looking for the ox cart drivers. But we haven't found them yet, Hirata said. That was bad enough, but Sano could tell it wasn't the worst problem Hirata had to report. 
what happened with Okita? He says he's not guilty. He has alibis. Hirao described his interview with the rice broker. We expected as much, Sano said. Did you check those alibis? He rather hesitated, then said, No. Why not? Sano asked, surprised. Okita has three of your top allies deeply in debt to him. He said he would call in the debts unless I left him alone. This was a serious threat with potentially dire political consequences. But Sano insisted, I won't be stopped by blackmail. I knew you would say that, he rather said. But as your chief retainer, I must advise you to be careful with Okita. Besides, maybe he is innocent. I propose that we concentrate on the other suspects first. That may be a problem too, Sano said, and told Hirata about the encounters with the other suspects. Nanbu is still barricaded inside the kennel with his dogs and refusing to talk, and unless I leave Jojo alone, I could find myself in trouble with the Shogun. That is a problem, Hirata agreed. I must remind you that your ultimate duty is to the Shogun, not your cousin or your uncle. Think of what his excellency will do if you displease him. Sano didn't have to think. The Shogun had threatened him and his family with death often enough. There must be a way to do right by the Shogun and finish this investigation. Well, until we figure it out, we have three suspects we can't touch, he rather said. I did do some discreet inquiries, Sano said. After a long day of meetings at the palace, he'd spent hours tracing Nanbu and Jojo's movements. I didn't find any evidence to prove that Nanbu and Jojo aren't the outstanding citizens they claim to be. Already exhausted, Sano said that this day's story of bad luck wasn't over yet. Have you any more news? He wrote about his head. The other day, while I was at Ueno Pond, he described how a mysterious stranger had begun stalking him. He later invaded his estate and had shown up while he'd been interviewing Okita, as he confessed that he'd killed Okita's servant. Sano listened in dismay, and not only because of the innocent life destroyed. Whoever stalking you has the power to manipulate people against their will to make them do things ordinarily wouldn't, Sano said. You're in extreme danger. That doesn't make up for what I did. Your rather stoic expression didn't hide his misery. And I can't promise that it won't happen again. He said reluctantly. I must ask you to take me off the investigation. As much as Sano hated to lose Hirata's help, or to see him suffering because he couldn't fulfill his duty to his master, he knew Hirata was right. Very well. And he mustn't take additional steps to provide Hirata and the public. I'm also relieving you of your other investigations and duties until you found out who's after you and dealt with this situation. Your detective can handle your work. If the Shogun asks about you, I'll tell him you are ill. He rather looked stricken, but he bowed in agreement. May I be excused? Sano nodded. After he rather had left, Sano went to look for his family. Perhaps Raiko had news of Chiyo. Perhaps the children could cheer Sano up. He found Akiko asleep in bed, but Masahiro was lying on his stomach in the parlor and drawing pictures. Is that a cow? Sano asked. No, father. It's a cat, Masahiro said. Can't you tell? Yeah, yeah, I was just joking, Sano said. It's better cat than I could ever draw. What else have you been doing today? As Masahiro chattered about his schoolwork, Sano's mind wandered to the investigation. Then Masahiro said, Father, what's divorce? That's when a husband and wife stops being married, Sano said absently. What's incest? Sano's attention snapped back to his son. Where did you hear that word? I don't know, someplace? Masahiro scribbled on his drawing pad. Well, you better ask your mother, Sano said, not eager to tackle sensitive subjects. She's not home. Where is she? She went to visit cousin Chiyo this morning. She said she would be spending the night. Sano heard thunder, went to the door and opened it. He and Masahiro looked at the rain streaming of the eaves. Well, at least she won't get caught in this weather. Wide veins of lightning split the sky above the Kumasawa estate. Rain deluged the mansion. Thunder boomed. The sentries outside the gate stood beneath its roof, while petrol guards inside the grounds sheltered under the mansion's eaves. They didn't notice the man atop the back wall. The lightning illuminated his crouched figure for an instant before the sky went dark and the thunder reverberated. When the lightning flared again, he was gone. 
The next thunderclad masked the noise he made when he landed on the ground inside the wall. In the women's quarters, Raigo played cards with Chiu and Fumiko. The chamber was stuffy, and the doors that led to the garden closed because of the storm. As Raigo dealt the cards, she listened to the rain clatters on the rooftops. Lightning flickered through the paper window panes, thunder cracked. Although pale and anxious, Chiu made an effort to smile at Raigo. I'm glad you're here. So am I, Raigo said, smiling back. Fumiko wasn't much for conversation. Intent on the game, she snatched up the cards Raigo dealt her. The women laid out, matched, and picked up cards illustrated with cherry trees, cranes standing beneath the red suns, and other suits. Raigo noticed that Fumiko won every round. She began to watch the girl and spied her slipping cards in and out of her sleeves. Fumiko was cheating. She must have learned how from the gangsters. Raigo decided against reprimanding her. Let the poor girl have some fun. And if Chiu noticed, she didn't seem to mind. There were issues more serious than cheating at cards. Raigo had a specific one on her mind. All day she wondered how to broach the delicate subject to Chiu and Fumiko. It couldn't be awaited any longer. There's something I must tell you, she began. The nun who was kidnapped, she had a disease. Oh, Chiu said mildly curious. What kind of disease? On her, Raigo glanced down at her lap. It came from the man who kidnapped her. Stricken by horrified comprehension at first, Chiu didn't speak. She looked at Fumiko, who was matching cards and seemed not too listening. Then she said, Fumiko is clean. I saw her when we bathed, but I... Do you? Raigo couldn't bring herself to ask Chiu outright if she had symptoms. No, Chiu was but... But... But it was too soon to know whether the rapist had given her the disease or not. Raigo said, If you find anything wrong, you must see a physician. Alright, Chiu said unhappily. Her duty done, Raigo rubbed her eyes, which were blurry with fatigue. Some two hours ago, the timber bells in Asakusa had rung at midnight. Everybody else in the house had gone to bed. If you're tired, you needn't stay up, Chiu said. No, I'm fine, Raigo said. She had confided that she and Fumiko stayed up late because of their nightmares, and Raigo felt a desire as well as an obligation to keep them company. As she dealt the cards again, Raigo felt a warm, damp draft on the back of her neck. The flame in the lantern wavered. The sound and smell of the rain filled the room. Fumiko sat up opposite her, dropped the cards she held. Fumiko's gaze passed Raigo, her eyes wide with terror. Raigo turned. A man stood inside the open door his black garment streaming water from the rain. He wore a hood that covered his entire head, with holes cut out for his eyes and mouth. Raising a sword in both hands, he lunged across the room towards Raiko and her friends. Chiu screamed. Fumiko jumped up to run, but tripped on her hem and fell. Raiko snatched up her dagger, which lay in a sheath on the floor beside her. She usually wore it strapped to her arm under her sleeve when she left home. She thought she would be safe here. The man rushed at Chiu, she raised her hands to protect herself, and his sword came swinging down at her. Raiko whipped out her dagger and slashed at the man. Even as he faltered and turned his weapon to Raiko, her blade cut him across his belly. He uttered an awful yowl. He dropped his sword, sank to his knees, and bent over the wound. Blood mixed with rainwater spilled onto the floor. Fumiko huddled nearby, hands over her mouth, staring at him. Chiu called, Help! Help! The intruder glared at Raiko through the holes in his hood, his eyes blazing with hatred and anger. He groped for his weapon, but toppled sideways. The emotion faded from his eyes as he collapsed amid playing cards drained red by his blood. Raiko heard men shouting and running in the corridors and outside the house. Then Major Kumasawa and his guards were in the room. Major Kumasawa wore a night robe, his feet bare. He carried a sword, which he pointed at the dead man. What happened? he demanded. Who is this? Raigo couldn't answer. She was suddenly dizzy, gasping for breath. She had a frightening sense, the time he had folded back on itself, and she was relieving an early attack during which her children had almost been murdered. Fumiko pointed to the mask the corpse were. It's the man who kidnapped us, she shrilled. He came back to get us, just like he said he would. Chapter 33 Sano roused groggily from his sleep into his dark chambers with a light from a lantern held by Detective Fukita who stood in the doorway. I'm sorry to bother you, Kita said, but there's an urgent message from Lady Raiko. Instantly wide awake, Sano said, What? He bolted upright in bed. Is she alright? 
Yes, Bukita said. There's been an attack at the Kumasawa house. She asked for you to come at once. Tano threw on some clothes. Heading for the door, he met Masahiro rubbing his sleepy eyes in the hall. Where are you going, father? To fetch your mother, Sano said. Don't worry, she's fine. Go back to bed. We'll be home soon. He rode through the dark, slumbering city with Marume and Fukita and some troops. The neighborhood gates had long been closed for the night. But Sano and his men wore the Tokugawa crest, and the watchman let them pass. After a hard ride along the highway, they reached the Kumasawa estate. It was lit up like a house on fire. Flames burned in metal lanterns along the walls and the gate. More lights flickered from within the courtyard. Smoke melted into the misty night. The guards led Sano's party through the gate. As they dismounted at the courtyard, Baiko came running out of the mansion. Dressed in a night robe, she was agitated and disheveled. Her face bare of makeup, her long hair carelessly braided. But she was indeed alive, as well and well, to Sano's relief. What happened? Sano said. As Raiko told him about the attack, he listened in horror that didn't ease much when she told him and she'd killed the man. Killing was a traumatic experience. Raiko must have been terrified, and she hadn't been the only one in danger. Where's Chinyu? Sano said. And Fumiko? Out of breath from excitement and speaking too fast, Raiko gestured towards the house. Chiyu and Fumiko stepped out onto the veranda. They looked shaken but unharmed. Major Kumasawa appeared behind them, fully dressed in his armor tunic, his swords on his waist, as if ready for battle. My daughter and her guests were untouched, he said, but they would have been killed if not for your wife. His tone conveyed some admiration and gratitude toward Draco, but more fury at the attack on his household. The man climbed over the wall. We found the rope he used. He got past my guards, killed two of them. He must have been a professional assassin. Where is the assassin now? In my backyard, Major Kumasawa said. Your wife insisted on keeping his body until you arrived. Sano cast a thankful glance at Raiko. She smiled briefly through her distress. He was proud of her for having the presence of mind to save the evidence. Come, Major Kumasawa said, lifting a lantern off the stand and walking down the steps. I'll show you. He led Sano around the mansion across the garden and through a gate. The detectives accompanied Sano and Major Kumasawa past the kitchen building to a small fenced yard. Major Kumasawa's lantern illuminated wooden bins that reeked of rotten fish and a blanket covered shape that lay on the ground. Fukita drew back the blanket. Underneath lay a youngish white man with the shaved crown of a samurai, a very built and an oval face with long, thick lashes that fringed his closed eyes. His grey kimono and trousers were drenched with blood from the wound Raiko had inflicted on his belly. The clothes had no identifying crest on the man. The man was a stranger to Sano. Do you know him? Sano asked Major Kumasawa. Never seen him before. Neither have my daughter or your wife, so they say. At first the girl thought, he was the kidnapper, but she was fooled by the mask. It must be the one like the kidnapper wore. When she saw his face, she changed her mind and said that she didn't recognize him after all. Maruma and Fukita shook their heads. They didn't know this as neither. Fukita covered the corpse. Do you know of anyone who would want to hurt your family? Sano said. No one with enough nerve to break into my house. We need to find out who he is. Concerned Phil Sano because he was starting to get an idea about the reason behind the attack. It'll be day soon, Kita said. Do you want us to take his body around the neighborhood and see if anyone recognizes him? Have some of my troops do it, Sano said. It's hardly standard procedure, but I seem no other way to identify the dead man. Sano hoped it would work better than his experiment at Edo Jail. Envisioning the gory corpse paraded through the streets, he added. Tell them to keep the body covered and to show the face. The detectives went off to obey. Sano and Major Kumasawa walked back towards the mansion. It is no coincidence. This happened after you started your investigation. Major Kumasawa spoke of stating a distasteful fact. No, I don't believe it is either. Sano experienced a bad familiar feeling. Once again, he hadn't solved the case soon enough. I think the assassin came to kill Chiyo so that she could never identify the man who raped her. Do you think he did it? In crudely severed hope. In Major Kumasawa's voice, Sano knew why Major Kumasawa wasn't ready to accept the idea. The dead assassin seemed so ordinary, not an evil monster, and Sano had no other reason to doubt that the man had acted alone, on his own behalf. No, I think he was sent by a guilty party. Those ox cart drivers? Major Kumasawa turned to Sano, his disbelief clear in the light from the brightening sky. Not them, Sano said. While I was looking for them, I found three new suspects. 
Joe made a Kumasawa about the kennel manager, the rice broker and the exorcist. The prize hall of Major Kumasawa was in the courtyard. This happened when? The names came up yesterday, Sano said. And you didn't tell me? Vex, Major Kumasawa said. I expected you to keep me informed about your progress. I'm informing you now. Although Sano could understand that Major Kumasawa didn't like being kept in the dark. He had wanted to prevent his uncle from confronting the suspects along and causing trouble again. Nanbu, Okita, and Jojo. As Major Kumasawa turned their names over on his tongue, he looked stunned to think they could have stooped to kidnapping and rape. Then he nodded, aware that even three such important men could have perverted tastes and no scrubbles. If one of them wanted my daughter and hired those ox cart drivers to kidnap, if one of them sent the assassin to kill her, how can I get my revenge? Despair pervaded his stern manner. As if I should go after Nanbu, I'll have to kill his dog. I'm in debt to Okita. He could make my pl- clan papers, and Jojo is the shogun's protege. He's a biddle. I can't touch them any more than you can. I don't care what happens to me, but I can't let my family suffer. So I've not been in the same position. Blocked because his family would share whatever punishment he incurred to many times to count. But he said, Let's not give up. Whichever man is guilty, I'm sure one or more of them is. He shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. Shouldn't, but will. Major Kumasawa faced Sano with determination. Because the investigation stops now. People had tried to stop his investigation before. Sano shook his head. You don't have authority to call off my investigation. Yes, I do, Major Kumasawa said. I requested your help. Now I'm withdrawing my request. You can't just dismiss me as if I were an unsatisfactory servant, Sano said. I'll continue the investigation until the criminal is brought to justice. Even if he sends another assassin who succeeds where this one failed, even if it means my daughter could die, another woman has already died, the nun, Sano reminded his uncle. She deserves justice. What in the hell do I care about her? And as long as the rapists and the kidnappers are at large, other women are in danger. Sano said. I don't care about them either, Major Kumasawa said, insisted. You must stop your investigation. Under different circumstances, Sano would have respected the wishes of the head of his mother's clan. I'll continue with or without your blessing, Sano said coldly. You might recall that my wife was attacked too. This is personal for me now. Major Kumasawa stared. Sano saw satisfaction as well as enmity in his eyes. The longer I know you, the more I realize that you are like your mother. You're just as willful and stubborn as she was. Well, that's your choice. When you choose your actions, you have to take the consequences. More enraged by the insult to his mother than to himself, Sano retorted. Willfulness and stubbornness appear to run in the family. It's obvious that my mother and I aren't the only one who share those traits. Then he forgot what he was saying, because Major Kumasawa's last sentence had struck a chord in his memory. His anger entwined with the same sense of familiarity that he felt during his first visit to the house. In his mind, Sano saw Major Kumasawa and his wife standing on their veranda. He heard the woman's voice pleading. He felt the same, dizzy sickness as he had then. Now the vague impression solidified into a memory of stunning clarity. I heard you say that to my mother, he said. Startled, Major Kumasawa said, what? Recollection flooded Sano, as if a door that sealed off his past had suddenly opened. I was here. My mother brought me. I must have been four or five years old. Now he knew why she defied the ban on contact with her family. I was sick with a fever. She was afraid I would die. Sano remembered lying in bed, racked by chills, struggling to breathe. Across the years he heard his mother crying and his father saying they couldn't afford a doctor or medicine. So she brought me here to ask for your help. You remember, Major Kumasawa frowned in dismay. Yes, I also remember that you say she deserved for me to suffer. You said, when you choose your actions, you have to take the consequences. Thanos' anger burned hotter, and then you turned us away. Major Kumasawa wore the expression of a man who believed he'd been put out of fire and discovered that it'd been smoldering underground when it blew up in his face. I thought you'd forgotten. I'm sure you wish I had. He watched Major Kumasawa realize that the incident constituted more than just punishment of a cast out relative and her child. Although it had happened in the distant past, it could be interpreted as striking a blow against Sano the Chamberlain, 
the Shogun's second in command, and the punishment for that was whatever Sano chose. I always regretted what I did, Michiko Musawa said. I should have helped Letsuko. You were an innocent child. You didn't deserve to suffer. I apologize. It's a little late for that, Sano said. I only did what was right at the time, Michiko Musawa said, fearful yet insistent. My parents were still alive. They forbade me to do anything for Itsuko. I had to respect their wishes. Sano regarded Michiko Kumasawa with contempt. Your tendency to justify yourself by blaming other people has made your apology a shame. It's a trait that's even worse than willfulness or stubbornness. So if you believe that you are entitled to things that you won't give to other people, when my mother asked you to save her child, you refused. Or when your daughter was kidnapped and you came to me for help, I agreed. Sano would have been sorry, yet if not for Chiyo, who was as blameless as his own child itself had been. So you're better man than I, Michiko Masao, resentful tone, bellied the compliment. Well, if you'd rather not trouble yourself on my behalf or that of my family any longer, let's stop your investigation. I can't do that, Sano said. I already explained why. The hostility between them solidified, thick as a humid draw near, as hot and suffocating as smoke. Michiko Masao said, since we'll never see eye to eye, there's no use talking anymore. Be sure to take your wife with you when you go. The dismissal stung Sano, even though he was eager to leave this place and never come back. As he walked towards the house to fetch Raiko, he heard Major Kumasawa call after him. He should never have broken the ban against contact with Itsuko and her kin. I'll uphold it from now on. Suits me fine, Sano said.